Okay, so I've put it on the same slides. So obviously last week we just covered Deep Lab Cut um, installation, how to get it up and running on your computer. There is multiple different ways. And since then, there is an easier way, um, but we won't spend any time on that today. We'll just go from where we kind of left off. Um, we kind of looked at opening a Python session, importing Deep Lab Cut and creating a project. Um, we created a project by using the you know, the, the user interface basically, so GUI. Um, and then we tried to do some labeling, but it just wouldn't hack it. So what I've actually done is I've labeled some data and I've just videoed it um, just so we don't have the same kind of problem. And then it takes the videos that you have told it to look at and it then asks you or prompts you to create a training data set. Um, when we talk about a training data set, it's just the data that the model actually sees. Um, so we'd have given it certain labels and it sees those labels. It learns from those labels and then it basically looks at some other data, knowing what it's learned from those labels, but data that it hasn't seen and labels that new data basically. Um, and then we look at the difference in how well those labels are, how accurate they are, and then we can make a judgment on how accurate that model, so how well that model fits that data. So fairly generic kind of concept across all deep learning, machine learning, statistics, all, all kind of the same, same aim. Um, and then we then train the network. Now with Deep Lab Cut, there's two kind of, there's two elements to it. So there's two areas of deep learning. The first one, which is what I've covered, is the pose estimation so you tell it the pose uh, you label the pose and then you give it some unseen data where that pose has not been identified and then it takes that information that pose information and then the second part of the deep learning is looking at that data to identify patterns and features between poses and that's how you get the behavior element of it so it's very 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 big topic and this is literally last session and this session is just the pose element of that um so we've covered this part kind of so far and then here is a a nice kind of diagram of it um so you've got your um this part here where you kind of create your project and your different folder structure then you label in you can use your interface for that um, and then creating the training data set and then training the network. Now, these things here, I haven't really um, looked at. So, for example, refining the labels. What we mean by refining the labels is having a look at those labels once that model has been trained and saying, well, actually, are these labels good enough? Um, have we done a good enough job at, at, at identifying those at identifying those markers and putting a label on there? Um, there is when you actually go into the, the labeling part, as a user, it will remember that you were the person that has labeled those. So you can change your users, um, which I thought was kind of quite nice, actually. It kind of, it names it on there as if to say, right, this user has done this type thing. Um, and then we kind of covered the condo environment based installation. Um, but actually what we discovered was that you don't actually need to do it that way anymore. You can literally just open up a, a kind of a Python command prompt and literally just load it directly with a pip install. Um, I don't know how I got so. Uh, obviously, it did the same thing, but it's a lot quicker way of, of getting to there. Um, so we can cover that at a later date if anybody is interested instead of doing it via the Anaconda environment, which we covered last week and is recorded. Um, so this kind of second part is looking at the labeling, how to label and the folder structure and what the output you get from this whole pose deep learning part. So I just wanted to start with a little bit of an overview of the purpose of deep lab cut. So basically, initially, when neuroscientists or 
people that were interested in understanding behaviours, they'd put markers on the animals and these markers could be invasive or well and very time consuming. Obviously, the level of invasiveness would have depended on the type of animal and what the question was that you're trying to ask. Um, and then deep lab cut basically gave rise to this markerless pose. Um, so you basically take an image and you put the dot on it. And that dot is obviously it's not a physical marker on the animal. It's just a marker on your image or your video. So that's how it kind of came about, um, just in case I didn't explain that well enough last week. Um, and when we talk about deep lab cut, literally it is transfer learning. So terminology transfer learning is there's already a model that is built. That model is not specific to your initial problem and you transfer the weights or the details from that model that make it what it is and you apply it to your own problem. Um, and that is transfer learning. And then I've also put a link in here to StatQuest, um, which is amazing. Um, but basically, it was just an overview of a neural network because there's two big words there, deep neural networks and transfer learning. So just kind of hope to make it a little bit clearer for, for anyone who is new to the topic or subject area. So today we're kind of looking at selecting the frames, labelling the frames and then training a network. And again, just this kind of image to reiterate. Um, it's this kind of section here. So extract frames, label frames, and then create the training data set and then train the network. So just talking about selecting the frames, um, when you create your project, which we did last week through the user interface, you can also do that from the command line. Um, and I did have a little play with that. However, one of the issues was that when you opened it from the command line, um, from your condo environment, it if I then came out of it, it wouldn't then go back to that labeling process. Um, but I did find that using the command prompt, it was really, really easy to just select all the videos and put them in the videos folder. Um, but just going from the, the user interface at the minute, you've opened it up, you've got your deep lab cut open, you've got that picture of the mouse and it says those three things, create project, load project and another button. Can't remember what the other button says, but it shows that it's not really that important. We're interested in the create or the load. Um, when you create a project, you basically get these five items that appear somewhere on your um, computer. Usually it ends up in your users. Um, so you've got the first folder, DLC dash models. Nothing is in that one at the moment. Um, it's just where it will then put your model weights will then go in there once you've run your model. Um, then I'm just going to go down to videos. Now videos is just where all your videos go that you're interested in looking at. Um, so not necessarily split into train or testing videos, just literally all the videos that you've got. Um, and then you select the frames. Now, when you select the frames, there is certain kind of parameters that you can select from. Um, and that then gets put into the label dash data folder. Um, when we say select frames, what it does is it goes through all the frames from all the videos within the project um, and it selects a sample of sub frames. Um, for, from each video to be labeled manually. Um, the kind of threshold that is set for this particular project is actually 18, um, but the default is 20. So it looks at getting 20 frames per video. Um, and what it basically does then is those 20 frames from that, um, that you've selected from that video, then go into the label dash data. So what you'll have in label dash data is you'll have a folder. That folder will be the name of the video. And then within that folder will be 20 images. So 20 frames from that one video. So if you had 10 videos and you took 20 frames from each of those videos, you would have uh, 10 folders and each folder would have 20 images. 
if that makes sense. Um, so altogether, you'd be looking at labeling 200 frames of data, basically. The kind of the minimum that has been promoted um, by Deep Lab Cut in their kind of web pages um, that have been made by themselves is that you need a minimal training data of around about 50 to 200 frames. Um, whether that is true or not, I, I don't know. Um, they didn't really provide any reasoning. Um, well, their reasoning was that it's transfer learning, so you're already using a really good model, then you're adapting it on top of that, and that is all you needed um, to be able to have. Can I ask a, a question, just to probe a little bit here? Yeah, go for it, yeah. Is um, for the guidelines for the training um, data set, it, are those guidelines, um, for example, per classification of behavior? I believe it is per classification of, of, of not not per classification of behavior, but per classification of like animal. Like category, for example, so if you had like a multi animal one, um, like cheetahs and lions, you'd have 50 to 100 frames of cheetahs and 50 to 200 frames of lions. When it comes down to the previous question about the individual behavior, um, it depends whether you're doing a multi animal or a single animal. And it also depends on like, for example, if you had 50 to 200 frames of um, a tiger licking its paw, but then you only had 10 frames of a tiger, of a tiger, you know, grooming its tail, then that would obviously be unbalanced. So then it would affect the behavior, the accuracy of that behavior thing, because you'd have less pose, poses of that. Does that make sense? I don't know if I've explained that very clearly. Maybe. I, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole too much, but I do have one other question I think is related to what's in my mind here is we're talking about, I mean, your application is, is one animal and some different behaviors in one kind of animal. And you'll have some video and you'll make some wire frames and um, <clears throat> But I guess one of the things that I'm wondering at this stage is um, you have a single image with a wireframe mm -hmm. uh, uh, to get at something like behavior. We're probably going to be need multiple frames of and and what we're actually classifying is the change in that wireframe over different um, frames as opposed to the state of the wireframe in a single frame. Do you see what I'm asking? <laughs> I do. And that that whole the first part is something that I've not even conquered yet. OK, because this is literally to be able. So you've got this is what I mean by you've got two models. Your first model is your pose estimation and actually being able to say that part of that animal is the ear and that part of that animal is the lips. But okay. then the output from this is you have a CSV, like the main output from this level of the pose estimation deep learning is you'd have the coordinates of where that um, animal part is and then the accuracy around where that animal part is. And then the next part is the analysis for the actual behaviours, which is why I think we need another wish. OK. I don't, I, I'm I'm happy to just to continue to watch. You have two questions. I don't know who was first. Sophie's got her hand up, and there was a question in the chat about what is meant by a wireframe. Okay, okay. So I'll answer the the wireframe one first. So by a wireframe, what we mean is um, what we're labeling here is body parts, and that's what they've referred to as like the pose estimation. Is you're saying that within there's going to be a maximum or minimum distance between the front leg and the back leg. But obviously to get to the front leg and the back leg, you're going to have to go up the front leg, across the back of the animal and down or across a bit more to the back leg of the animal. And that journey from the point from the front leg to the back to the back leg is the wireframe. And it's the movement in those points along the wireframe, that's how they have used the model 
to predict and observe behaviours in animals. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Lovely. And um, Sophie, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, just a quick general question. Do we know if um, resolution of the videos has any impact on like the accuracy or anything? Um, I haven't read a paper on that. Um, I believe it does with 2D images for computer vision. So I assume it would have the exact same with video images. Um, especially because you put in that pinpoint of where that point is on the animal and obviously if it's pixelated it's not going to be able to guarantee that exact pinpoint and what it does take into account pixel quality and pixel value so I'd say that yes it does have an impact from my own experience. Ed, Matt have you got anything to add to that one? Yeah it will definitely have an impact it's you know the resolution will affect what features are available in those frames, just like in a classification problem. It also has a big impact on training of, of the model, the time required to train, and also on the performance of the model for new predictions. So on that level, yes, but I don't know enough about this particular application myself uh, to understand exactly how that will work but it'll have a much bigger effect on training time if you have real high resolution video as opposed to lower resolution. And if you, if you don't need it to, just like with pictures on, um, on regular classification and detection, if you don't need high resolution, you definitely want to avoid um, using it either at when you capture it uh, or when you're training the model, you could downsample the video. Of course, with video, You've got a big burden because even those little modest pictures of uh, the cows feeding in those little troughs start to add up in a big way. And so it becomes a real burden of just how to handle the data, not even way before we even get to analyzing it. So in, in that sense, that's probably the biggest sense of how it affects this, this kind of problem. So I'm guessing for this, would you need to know your frame rate as well then when you're kind of feeding? this yeah so frame weight well batch size frame weight are all things that you kind of put at the in in the this config.yaml file yeah cool thanks so um so yeah you've got your labeled data and your videos folder and your config.yaml um you can also do this under the extract frames tab um, which is within your user interface. And then now I'm just going to go on and have and sh show you in a little more detail this config.yaml file. Um, this first kind of section here is where all of the initial things that you mentioned when you'd create that project, you, there was a box to like put your name, the experimenter, um, and select whether you were having a multi-animal project or a single animal project. Obviously this one's false because we have just got a single animal um, within my kind of problem. Um, then it specifies your project path. And then it also has here a comment for every single, um, so initially I had 96 videos in this file. I, I, I totally dyed it back to two. Um, so this is the URL to two videos within the videos folder. Then I was interested in kind of what kind of body parts I am mentioning here. Um, and you can see that I've done left ear, right ear, left nostril and right nostril. So I started off really, really basic, really simple, because um, these are the features that I wanted to identify within uh, the frame of the video. Then you can see here I put the number of frames. So this one here is 20. Um, and then I have this second box here, uh, sorry, fourth box, which is the skeleton box. So the other terminology that was used earlier was the uh, multi um, wireframe. So it's kind of the same thing, skeleton wireframe. And it's just saying, so, OK, where do you go after the left ear? 
left nostril, then across to the right nostril, then to the right ear. So it's kind of that pattern of like that um, across the animal. Obviously, it will depend. Um, but I've not done any research on this, but one of the things that I will be interested in in the future is the structure of that. What what impact does the structure of that skeleton have on my final outcome? Does it have an impact? And if so, what level of the impact is that? Um, and then there is a final <clears throat> box, which is your training evaluation box. So it's telling um, the default model type, which is ResNet 50, um, and the batch size, which is eight. So they're kind of terminologies that you'd be aware of in any other um, kind of deep learning. There is this other one, which is a snapshot index. And this basically set, you're basically telling it where you want the check not um the check point to be within that one now minus one just means all so you want continuous uh check check points to be evaluated um then this here is a video of me labeling so i'd gone into the the user interface i had selected my frames so within my frames um i had within the label so sorry i'm just gonna go back to this one here within the label data okay i i had now got the frames and each frame was in a folder and that folder represented the video and it, the name of the video was the the folder name and then it had split it into 18 um frames and down here, I'd got the selections that I had put in my config.yaml. You pick on the, the, uh, the kind of cross up here, and then you select through. Now you can see here that I actually didn't have a left ear. So I had left ear here. I didn't have one, couldn't really identify that on the image. So I just selected right ear and put that one in. Then I had left nostril. Um, and then I didn't really put the right nostril because I didn't really think you could see it. Um, obviously, you, some people might argue differently, um, but I didn't think it was clear enough where I could see like the notch there. So I thought, well, that represents the left nostril only slightly, still very kind of um, not the clearest, I guess. And then each point has a different colour um, and you just basically continue to select through. And then once you've selected through all of them, you go file and you just save every single um, layer that you've got. Has anyone got any, any questions on this? Just to um, head back a few, can you see how here, when we're putting in the, the skeleton, we've also got the, the cutoff size, the dot size and the alpha value. So these ones are literally the, the marker size by dot size. Um, and then we've got like, <coughs> sorry, the alpha value, which says the transparency of the dot. So how, how opaque you kind of want it to be. Um, then you have to create your training data set. So you can see here that we've got different types of models that you can have as your kind of base model. So the default is ResNet 50. Um, and if you go to Mathia um, 2018, there's a lot of detail in that. And I've put all of those at the end of this, um, of this um, PowerPoint presentation. Just to uh, share with you, uh, this is what happened when I, uh, ran the model so i'd created my training data set and now i wanted to train my network so it kind of isn't it isn't really having it it's kind of yeah it's, it's not liking it at all um i need to transfer it into a google colab notebook so i can use the gpu on there um but yeah it's literally just sitting here now it won't kind of move um but i'm just going to go back a few steps and just show you the label data so this here, um, 2023 Feb, sorry, yeah, sorry, 8th of Feb um, was the date that the video was actually taken and it was taken at 18.04. Um, and if we click into there, we can see that we've got the image 
for each, um, sorry, the frames. So we've got uh, 18 frames. But once I've labeled that data, this .csv and this .h5 file get created. And if you click on this .csv file, um, you can see, I hope everyone can see that now, you've got the scorer at the top, the body part, and then you've got the coordinate. Then you've got your labeled data for every row, uh, the video that it's from, and then the, the frame, uh, each individual frame. Where it's blank, um, so here, for example, these ones are blank, so that means that this image here didn't show a left ear, um, nor did this image here, um, or this one, or this one. Sorry, that's an X and a Y. So this, this image basically had no left ear. Uh, also had no right ear on show, um, but it did have a left nostril and a right nostril within the image. So it just basically would, would chuck out a blank. If you didn't obviously put a dot, you got an NA or, or a, a blank. Um, and you've George, got one. I, of the... I have a question here. Yeah, go, go, go. My question is, um, <clears throat> uh, it, it's a relatively simple question, but I think there's some subtlety to it that might even bear some discussion. Is um, how do you choose how many uh, joints that you are going to label? So you can have as many as you want. Even some of them have, um, so like, you know, like the center of the belly, they might have like a mid belly thing. So it's not necessarily a joint. It's just a point of interest that might represent movement within the area that you're interested in. Um, I don't think there's not a set standard um, and I've not read any particular literature on it. Um, it literally is just however many you think you need. I think I need more for this particular problem, personally. Um, I don't think that it's enough, the ones that I've got. And I also think that potentially I would be important, even though the I doesn't physically move, it puts it into kind of relativeness and relative distance from the ear um, and then the kind of the nostrils. Um, I also think I should have a lower one at the bottom of the jaw for when the cow's like at the side. And I also think I should have tongue. So when the tongue can be seen, tongue will be present. Um, so, yeah, I don't think there is there's, there's no set standard at all. I guess I was thinking of things like <clears throat> the features that um, in a handful of frames would be used to characterize uh, the sorting, the food sorting behavior that you're interested in. Like if you're looking from above, um, maybe if this this is the head of the cow from above, um, and if the head was moving like this, that it might be the distance between a feature that you do right between the ears on top of the head and the mm -hmm. tip of the nose. And so the the distance between those two features as the head moves, and I think it's things like that that you might <clears throat> want to consider to choose how many points you use for your wireframe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think it's worth like maybe a paper in itself to assess how effective it is between different points. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe it is. But um, <clears throat> what, why did you choose these four? I guess is another way of asking that question. And why not if why not only two points, or or why not ten points? Um, because I didn't want to mess too much with the YAML file. Okay. And, and what is the what does the YAML file look like if this is your CSV? I'm kind of the, interested to look at that. Yeah, yeah. So this is the YAML file up here. This is the exact one I use. So oh, left ear, okay. gotcha. gotcha. right nostril. So you can see like here in the skeleton, can you see how it's like left ear, left, left nostril? We'll just forget that that is those words. You'd have like left ear would be one, um, but then it would go into a, a second kind of branch and it would be one, two. And then below that, you'd have right nostril. So it's like each line is like one, two, and then one, two within itself, like it's indexed. And that's how it's represented. It, it, yeah, 
it's interesting but I wasn't sure okay well what about if you've got more than one and how do you make that group like how like for example why haven't I done left ear right ear left nostril right nostril because you could argue that that is that would work as well I guess each of these are um are classes that you'll be um detecting on each frame and i am interested to see how how fast it goes mm -hmm. so are yeah. you to the stage now where ha have you been able to perform transfer learning for the first time yet or are you still working on that you've created a training data set and you're still now you're at the phase of using that to uh, use to perform transfer learning yeah but i need i need to get it on google colab um because it's not yeah it's just freezing every time i try to run it through the user interface it's just not um it's just not responding at the minute it's stick can you see this is basically the output that i've had from it so i know it's doing something um and it's just uh, dashing here and it's given me a loss rate um but something isn't Something isn't right. Is this through what I think of as the Python IDE that you're running this? Um, yeah, this is this command prompt, but this is where I ran it from. So this user interface. It's actually not really a bad user interface. I just think it's just not. It's just not having it for me. Every time I tried to label the data last week on it and it just wouldn't have it with everything else going on, it just crashed. So. What what do you expect to happen here on on this uh, user so interface? What, what my output should be, um, so I'm just gonna kind of go back to my presentation. So the output should be something that's literally just like obviously you, you, a normal a normal model output. So like your error, your loss, your accuracy. Mm -hmm. um, but what you're looking for is um, the coordinates within a, from a new image, uh, sorry, a new frame um, that contains the marker. So like left but left uh, left nostril, right nostril, but then also the prediction accuracy of that marker within each frame of that video for every video and then the next part when you've got that output from this deep learning part um because obviously you might have something like a thousand videos that you want to understand the behavior from it means you don't have to label all a thousand you've only got to label some then obviously put the pose estimations on all the thousand based on your model that you've built and then you'd put that and then you'd analyze the coordinates to extract movement, pose and behavior information from the output of this. So this output is an input to the next stage. Yeah, so this, this is like the transfer learning stage before you're not to the stage yet where you would use it on a novel video it hasn't seen. Yeah. <clears throat> OK. Um, so I guess we're uh, going to wait with bated breath until we have <laughs> until we uh, get the next part of this. So we're, you're taking us on your journey and often it is hard to use a tool that somebody else has done. But um, I think it's a very good idea to go to Colab because then, you know, it's not your laptop and you're not running lots of other stuff at the same time and you've got the gpu which we know it'll go loads and loads faster so uh, do you want to wait for two weeks uh, or do you want to carry this over to next week um i'm e either is fine with me I, I, either is fine people are like want to break from it that's fine um i'm just enjoying just learning about it really um, got another question in the chat about how many frames uh, you labeled? Uh, so I only labeled 18, 18, 36 frames. So I had 18 frames per video was what Did, I had. Was, and I was only there had a test frame? When you say you want to get the coordinates, 
Mm -hmm. Is it giving you the coordinates of the points you labelled? That's what you're wanting. Um, it gives them me in the X and Y that was in the CSV that was outputted in the in the labelled training. So it was. Um, these. So these are the coordinates from my labels. But this is on scene data because obviously I've, I've labelled it. And then once the model has ran, I will then run it on data that it hasn't seen. And then it will output me these coordinates, but also with a figure of accuracy. Yeah, I think... Uh, I, Thank you. I think... Um, I think I want to just think out loud for a second and uh, confirm that I understand what this is doing. I think I do, but I think there's still some parts that I don't quite understand fully. Maybe I'll just take the screen just briefly and make a doodle here. Have you guys ever seen that um, that kind of classic study of animal movement from those um, Still, still pictures like this. This isn't exactly it, but um, uh, let me see. I'm gonna. Change That's a it good to, example of one, though. Yeah, let me just change it to my other screen here. There we go. <clears throat> so what I think, what I think you've done, George. What I think you're wanting to do is, let's say that you have. Um, <clears throat> oops. <laughs> I, I write on my tablet so much that um, I started writing it on it, but the tablet wasn't there for me to write on it yet. <laughs> Let's say that you've got a film of two minutes of a horse running with a jockey. And let's say that these 12 frames are sampled out of the, the film. And so you've got hundreds of frames of film, and these are just a sample of it. And I think what the program is wanting you to do is I think you're wanting to um, label joints on the horse to get X, Y points, and you want to label the same joint in the same place on every horse. I've done I've done a kind of stupid one, so I'm going to do a different one that's smarter now. I'm going to make a goldenrod one, and I'm going to do the the tip of the same foot for each one and that changes position oops that changes position quite a lot on all the frames and i think it's the feature on uh, each of these frames for that that foot i think i've probably switched my foot here which is a problem but uh it's the feature on each of these uh frames that's being picked out on all the other frames that's what you want to make a prediction of and you want to make this with enough points um, that you end up with um, a, uh, what, what color should I make my skeleton? I'll make it like this. So you want to make it with enough points that you can um, tell the, the um, difference between the different appendages and their individual movements and this is kind of what george was referring to what you were referring to george is the wireframe it's basically like a stick figure that if i if i make a um an overlay of the different joints it's just the thing that connects the lines between all the different joints and uh, what's being tracked here, I don't have enough colors to do this, but <clears throat> each one of these is a unique point in time that's going to carry over to the next frame. And uh, I guess what you, the trick here that you need to do is you need to pick points based on, you know, like the top of the head or the ear that uh, the features show up in many of the videos. Because if they're not showing up in many of the videos, uh, many of the frames, that is, 
then you're not going to identify them and the nature of the wireframe, you know, won't be consistent across the whole video. I think that's what's happening here. I think you did describe it pretty well. I just I wanted to visualize it all at once. Mm -hmm. But just I know I know you're you might be aware of this, Ed, but just to like say it again, it the, the part that I've kind of just covered is so we're still interested. What hasn't been covered is the relationship between, for example, your red point on your first one yeah. and your red point on your second one. Yeah. The relationship between those two hasn't been explored yet. Yeah, I, that's that was kind of my question earlier was. How that's going to work to identify a behavior because it would be the difference. Um, if you if you kind of look at, let's say that it's these these two pictures here, and let's say you pick um, the knee, and let's say you pick the tip of the foot, let's say you pick um, where the leg connects to the body. Now here you've got a wireframe, and in in this one, the wireframe would look like this, and in this one, the wireframe would look like this. And uh, you know what we kind of want to do is to be able to tell the difference between those across multiple videos as, as a behavior, or as the animal doing something that you can predict as opposed to what we'd normally do in classification and detection, which is just to tell the difference between these three parts of the body. So it is, I haven't quite, I haven't quite figured out yet how this system makes a distinction between these two different tasks. <laughs> yeah. I think it does, but I can't quite understand how it does that yet. It does, but it is a separate GitHub repro. Okay, so we're not to that part yet. No, 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 no. I mean, it kind of caught me a bit off guard. Um, the fact that there is two, there is two deep learning models in this. You've got your basic identifying a body part or an object within an image using the train and the test um, to get enough video video footage that is labelled. That's one problem, and I guess they've used this in a bid or an attempt to reduce the amount of labeling that is required because of the level of labeling that is required from a video being turned into a frame, uh, multiple frames. So it does make sense uh, why they've done that, because um, it does save time. Um, in your labeling so far, mm -hmm. if it was perfect, um, this system, you'd have a video that would have every feature in every frame that you label and in every other frame. But already we know because you have missing points there, that's not the case with yours. And so we're already learning a lot. And uh, I guess, have you made a, a con conclusion or do you have a suspicion that we need to think about the video that we're getting and what's in the video? Definitely, yeah. But yeah, I mean, this is the first batch of video footage that I took. So since then, the camera has changed position, um, but I've not really been bogged down on that. I just want to get it working, you know, run deep lab cut basically from start to finish mm. and then uh, and then make it more. Precise to my problem. I think. Just thinking about it and seeing what you've got here so far, the most important thing to do is to get this in a repo that you can factorize with GitHub and Colab. That'll be the single thing that will move this forward faster than anything else. Yeah, definitely. Comments, questions, very interesting. Yeah, I've got a comment. Uh, because I can see really there are like two stages here. That's the very static one, identifying body parts, and then there will be the the proper part of the job. 
I'm just wondering how uh, the inaccuracies in the first stage can affect stage two. And my gut feeling is that there can be quite massive consequences for inaccurate, erroneous uh, labeling at the, fir the first stage onto the second one. Do you think so? Definitely, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I think you have to pick features um, that are repeatable. We know how important that is, but I wonder when you click on a point, is is there a setting in there, something that makes the bounding box a certain diameter away from the point you click on to grab those features? There must be. Yeah, potentially. potentially. You can definitely mess with the dot itself, but whether how to mess with the dot in relation to all the other dots? I'm not entirely sure. I'm really just thinking about one single dot because the feature will be, you know, like the other problems we've worked on. If you're clicking on the base of the ear, for example, uh, does it grab pixels around the point that you, you're calling the base of the ear to find the base of the ear every time? It, it can't just be a single pixel. It has to be it has to be grabbing some information around the single point. And I wonder if that's like, could it be something as simple as the size of, of the the dot you use to visualize it, or is it something different, some kind of radius around it? I know the the dot size is usually set to twelve, but yeah, like you said, I don't know if it's just the dot of where the actual object is because I guess your dot really could change in size depending on what you're identifying. Like if you were identifying a full eye, you'd probably have a bigger dot than if you were just identifying the tip of an ear. I, I guess I was just thinking that the the dot size was human visualization and, and might depend on the resolution of the you know source data. But I guess it could be um, it could be um, related to the actual training feature set. <clears throat> okay, questions, comments. Well, thanks, Sarah's Anna, got a, Sarah's got a question. Okay, just it's reminding me of um, like animated films and how they move things. So I don't know whether there's any. Um, literature on how they make you know animated cartoons of how things move whether any of that might be useful can always have a look um, thank you i was gonna say i worked on a project years ago um about a similar application in sports i can see if i could dig up some literature for you george Oh, yeah, if, if, if it's to hand and you can just send it over, then yeah, that'd be grand. But thank you. Thanks. OK, I'm looking forward to seeing the advancement next week. Thank you, George. Yeah, sorry, it's, it's slow and steady, but slow and steady it's wins a, the race. It's such an interesting problem. I, <laughs> I think it could be interesting to a lot of people. So uh, it's it's fun watching it. Maybe yeah. we'll talk amongst ourselves and I think maybe we'll have a week off and um, Jimic I know is um, biting at the bit to go on the spatial statistics chapter next week. So uh, we'll stick with that and then we'll bring you back the week after that to give us a final installment of the, the um, transfer learning part of this. That'll give you time to work out CoLab and the GPU. Okay. Perfect. Thank you guys. Thank you. All right. Thanks again, George. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See you later. I'm going to stop the recording. There we go.